Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. Uh, today we're going to start with a 43-year-old male who was just released from jail and his family found him in the bathroom frantically um, flushing pills once they knocked the door down, but they think he was probably taking a lot of pills before they did. Um, and he's becoming increasingly unresponsive for the EMS crew. His initial set of vitals look like a heart rate of 168, a blood pressure of 150 over 114, oxygen saturation of 91% on room air, <clears throat> and a blood sugar of 114. And when we look at these vital signs, the ones that stick out to me are a very high heart rate, a very high blood pressure. This indicates to me some sort of increased sympathetic activity, whether that is in the setting of him taking a lot of pills in the bathroom, maybe methamphetamine, uh, this could be alcohol withdrawal, some sort of sympathetic surge with a high heart rate, high blood pressure. That's kind of what I'm thinking going into this. But of course, anytime someone's got an overdose, what we're going to do is quickly get a 12 lead. Um, and what we find on this one looks like this. We're going to read it just like we do the same way every time. Looking here at the rate, we've got a rate of 174. According to the computer, we're going to check that with our eyeballs, see if we agree. It definitely looks fast to the naked eye. And I'm going to start over here at V4. I see a QRS complex that lines up with a thick red line. I'm going to count down 300, 150. Sure enough, this falls between, the next QRS falls between 150, 300, closer to 150. I would agree, it's probably around 170. So it's definitely very tachycardic. Um, next we move on to our rhythm, and this one can get a little tricky. First question we ask ourselves is there a P wave before every QRS? And our best place to find P waves is in lead two. When I look at lead two, it's very difficult to discern any clearly demarcated P waves here. I think I see one right here. Um, maybe I can hallucinate one right there. But moving across the rest of this 12 lead, maybe a P wave there. They're not consistent, and I definitely don't see a P wave before every single QRS. My next question is, is this regular or is this irregular? And the faster the heart rate is, the more difficult this can be to determine. Because if it's fast, there may only be subtle changes between the ventricular depolarizations. And so what I like to do here is what I call march this out. And I've already pre-marked some lines here. But find an area where you can just mark three QRS complexes and see if they march out. And if I do that here, they don't match up as I move it down. And if it was truly a regular rhythm, it would be the same all the way down the 12 lead. But since they're not matching up here, what this is telling me is I have an irregular rhythm. So I have no P waves and an irregular rhythm. We call this irregularly irregular. This is usually suggestive of atrial fibrillation. And since this rate is so fast, we call this AFib with RVR. As we're moving on down at the other things that we look at, we start to evaluate our axis. So we look at lead one and lead AVF. Here um, we have our thumb. Most of the majority of the QRS is up in lead one. Uh, AVF, it's pretty hard to tell, but I would call this one mostly down. Um, if you remember our tiebreaker, we can always go to lead two as a tiebreaker for our right thumb. This is down, so it confirms that we're down. I've got a left thumb in the air. We're going to agree with the computer here that this is left axis deviation, although it's a little bit subtle, and it's probably due to the rate. Um, then we move on to our intervals. We've got our QRS and our QTC that we're looking at. Our QRS, remember, we want that to be less than 120. Here we're 80. We're good to go. Um, and then our QTC is 477, little long. Remember, 450 is technically long. 500 is when we're at risk for spontaneous dysrhythmia. We're a little bit on the long side here. Going to keep an eye on it. Probably wouldn't want to give this guy Zofran. Other than that, just good to know. And then we start to evaluate our ST segments. And it's not uncommon when someone, especially older people, when they have a rate this high, that poor little heart is like running a marathon. And that's basically a stress test for them. And so sometimes rates like this will cause ST depressions in certain leads where they may have some underlying heart disease. 
Um, I always read from left to right, looking at two, three, AVF here. I'm not really seeing any ST elevations or depressions. Same thing in one, um, AVL. No ST depressions there. Septal leads look okay. Um, maybe starting to have just a slight suggestion of an ST segment kind of depression in V5 and V6 here. But again, I think that's probably rate dependent. I don't think this is a STEMI. I think what I need to do is probably slow that heart down or figure out why it's beating so fast. Um, so I'd call ST segments normal. At the end of the day, when we put all this together, what we have, we've got a tachycardic, irregularly irregular rhythm, looks like AFib. This is called atrial fibrillation with RVR, rate of 174, with a left axis deviation, a long QT, and no ST segment elevations or depression. So AFib with RVR. And the only thing that makes it RVR is the fact that it's over 100. You can have AFib that's less than 100, and that's okay as well. But once it gets over 100, that's the way to say you have tachycardia plus AFib. And that just means the atria are depolarizing very fast and very scattered and very unorganized, but all of those are being conducted to the ventricles, making those ventricles beat very fast. If you remember normal conduction, we have an impulse very organized, starts in the sinoatrial node, makes a P wave, gets transmitted to the AV node, pauses for a second, goes down the right bundle, goes down the left bundle, we get ventricular depolarization. That's the way it's supposed to work. But in AFib, what's happening is just little sparks of beats that are flying all over both of the atria, telling everyone's telling the ventricle to contract, and the poor little ventricle is doing its best to keep up with all of these signals. And that's exactly what's happening in this heart. So sometimes all the signals get through, but the ventricles still need time to repolarize. And so that's why it's irregularly irregular, as some signals get through, some don't. Not very organized. That's what you see here basically chaos. <laughs> so we need to ask ourselves why. We typically see this rhythm very often and a lot of times it's in our older patients and I think of it as a manifestation of something else that's going on. So if you see this, it, doesn't necess it means they may have some like underlying heart disease at baseline, but I tend to think of it as more of a metabolic emergency. I need to figure out why is this happening? Are they on drugs? Did they not take their beta blocker? Is this guy on meth or some other overdose? Are they septic? It's very common in sepsis. Are they hypoxic? Um, what about alcohol withdrawal? What about GI bleed? All of these underlying things can cause this heart to beat irregularly and we can address these things, but they're important to ask about. Um, the longer that they're in this rhythm, the harder it is for the heart and over time can lead to cardiomyopathy or congestive heart failure. And so when we think about what to do about these things, we can treat these things. Um, if it's a volume problem, you can give volume. This is, sepsis is a volume problem. GI bleed is a volume problem. Hypoxia, we can give oxygen. If it's alcohol withdrawal, you clearly usually get a history of that and you can give benzos. So if you try to treat the underlying cause, a lot of times you can fix the AFib with RVR. So my general approach to AFib with RVR is to fix any hypoxia, really consider what's wrong, right? And then attempt fluid. A lot of times just a 500 cc bolus is gonna help. Um, going back to the beginning of this case, the reason we got this 12 lead in the first place was because this gentleman had had an overdose and was found in the bathroom with a bunch of pills. Anytime we have an overdose, we get a 12 lead because really what we're looking for is a TCA toxicity because we're gonna treat that very different. This will be a whole different weekly EKG, so we'll talk about that later. But we get an EKG in every overdose. We look for signs of TCA toxicity, but in this one, we don't see them. We see AFib with RVR, so we start to address our underlying causes, start with a fluid challenge. If they are unstable, meaning they're unresponsive, declining mental status, hypotensive, you can go ahead and attempt a synchronized cardioversion. Just realize that these people may have been developing clots in their atria and you can cause a stroke. So you gotta really closely weigh the benefit and the risk of trying to defibrillate this rhythm. Um, my first suggestion would be to start with fluid and oxygen and see if that gets you where you'd like to be. 
And that is it for today. Uh, AFib with RVR, very common rhythm that we see in the field. And thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.